Hello. Um, thank you to Mike and Emily and Brona for inviting me all the way from Glasgow. I came down this morning on the train and I hate to admit I was working hard trying to work out what on earth I was going to say. So I'm here to talk about the piece of work that I'm showing in the Time, Time and Motion show in Liverpool, which is from 2006, which is scaringly almost eight years ago. It's a project called Timelines, and I made it over the course of four weeks that summer. So I'm going to talk about what I was doing before this project and what I went on to do after to show hopefully how I slowly developed an awareness of my own labour conditions, of one, uh, of one of a new wave of young self-employed artists, unaware guinea pigs, entering into this newly created, intangible and invisible world of work known as the creative industries at the beginning of last decade. So I graduated from my fine art degree in 2001 and whilst I was a student, I acquired my first mobile phone, my first digital camera, my first PC, and I learnt how to write emails and how to build websites. So these were the tools and the skills that I had when I entered the real world um, to set about making my work and also starting my career. This technology had always been a part of my adult working life and therefore I never thought to question the impact it had because I just didn't know any different. It was when I was a student that I began the first of many data collecting activities with this project called Eat22 for which I photographed everything that I ate for an entire year and meticulously recorded the exact time, date and location of each of the photographs in an enormous spreadsheet with um, 1,640 entries in total. So five years quickly passed where I undertook several of these year-long projects um, for which I recorded data about many different aspects of my everyday routine until 2006 when everything changed. It was that summer that I was invited to take part in a project called Part Time which was put together by a Liverpool-based artist called Stephen Renshaw. It's a quite complex project which is probably a whole lecture in itself but to quickly summarize it involved asking three artists to work undercover in low-wage jobs over the course of four weeks and to make uh, as a sort of alternative residency and to make work in response to their experiences so this was the first time um, that I'd really been pushed to to think about and analyze what my relationship to work I always kind of had this inkling, um, nagging feeling that I was a bit of a workaholic. Um, but it was the first time that I'd began to examine more closely uh, that when I began to do this, I began to realise that actually my whole life felt like work. Even the things that I did for fun, the things that I did to keep myself alive, the domestic chores around my flat, whatever it was, it seemed to morph into, morph together into what felt like an endless stream of labour. Did I ever relax? How much of this was actually creative work? How much time was I flittering away on pointless activities like surfing the internet or cleaning the toilet? I needed to find the answers. And it felt like the only way I could do that um, was to orchestrate a extreme data collecting activity where I monitored everything that I did 24 hours a day for the whole four weeks of the project and there were no smartphones in these days not in 2006 back in the dark ages no handy life tracking apps I did it all the hard way with notebooks and a watch and I ruthlessly self-monitored myself um, noting down the exact time when I changed from doing one of the 17 predefined activities to another. 
So it drove me insane, this process, but I kept going, spending hours each evening processing all the data that I collected. And the end result were these 28 colour-coded timelines, seven of which are on display for the first time as part of the Time and Motion show. But this was the last straw that broke the camel's back, and I knew that this activity was completely ridiculous, that I was adding layers and layers of pointless work onto what was already quite a lot of pointless work. So I decided to quit, and I became what I call a recovering data collector, and I entered into this period of reflection and reinvention where I started to look critically at the life I'd been living and the work that I'd been doing. And it was only then that I began to notice the wider social, political and economic forces which had been the cause of my behaviour and the oppression that I had felt. So my work changed quite dramatically over the next few years as I began to make it my mission to investigate, expose and challenge these same social, political and economic forces, which cause us to behave in ways which are not necessarily all that good for our well-being. And it was then that I began to realise the significance of addressing our labour conditions precisely because we spend so much bloody time working. And it was also then that I realised that I wasn't suffering alone, that this push towards self-employment or this privatisation of work had meant that there were people in studios, in homes, in their flats all over the country, completely unaware of each other's problems, willing themselves to work these longer and longer working hours. So in 2011, I coordinated a project to attempt to bring these people together. The Wel Workathon for the Self-Employed was a one-day event at which we aimed to set the record for the greatest number of self-employed people working together in the same place at the same time over the course of a normal nine-to-five day. The intention was to um, use the, this fun uh, world record-setting challenge to draw people together and to impose a strict nine-to-five on them um, to create awareness for their labour conditions but also put them into a situation where they could possibly work together to try to challenge them. We set the record of 54 in London and then beat it later that year in Newcastle. Um, but this project, the irony is that this project came about as a result of my own self-exploitation in 2011, which was the year after I completed my Masters at Glasgow School of Art. I took on far too much work than I could cope with. In fact, I worked every single day that year, bar six. So in 2012, I made a conscious decision to try to address this. And I began to turn against the technology which I began to see as my oppressor in the tradition of the Luddites. So, for the first month of the year, January 2012, I attempted what I called an email detox. Anybody that sent me an email during that month received an autoresponder detailing my increase in email output over the last decade and politely saying that I wouldn't respond to them until February. I admit this didn't last as long as I'd hoped. I only uh, stuck it out for about five days. Um, <laughs> But it made me understand the need to regulate my relationship to technology and to learn to spend as much time away from it as possible. That time that it freed up allowed me to indulge in some research activities like reading volume one of Karl Marx's Capital. And I was quite surprised to find on page 380 this quote about machinery becomes in the hands of capital the most powerful means um, for lengthening the working day beyond the bounds set by human nature. It was at that point that I made the decision that I was never going to get a smartphone. That is a mugs game. I would never allow work to encroach on my life to that extent. 
But I admit, I still do self-exploit. I still work seven days a week. But the most important thing I've learned over the last few years is to check who is benefiting from that self-exploitation. What cause is that exploitation in? So for the last five years, I have been campaigning, investing huge amounts of this work ethic that I have in... um, campaigning for the public ownership, return to public ownership of our public transport system. So this, hopefully, if I am successful, will be um, the benefit of all my hard work and effort. But the other important thing to um, point out, and this has cropped up in some of the other presentations, is that work isn't necessarily always bad. And actually, I go to my studio on a Saturday morning um, at nine o'clock, bright and early, because it's that de-alienated creative labour which happens for me normally away from my computer screen where I'm just reading, writing in my notebook and having ideas. That is the work that makes me happy and that gives my life meaning and that actually makes everything feel okay so that's why i keep doing it